EVP and this at IFC as well as the CEO of IFC. It's the private sector arm of the World Bank Group. I have a very good friend of mine, Peter Voike, who's the former managing director at the World Bank Group as well as the former EVP at I IFC as well as the former CEO of IFC. And he has a senior advisor here at CSIS who's going to introduce Mr. Jin Young Tsai. And Mr. Uh, Jin Young Tsai are going to sit down and, and take a seat while Mr. Voike uh, introduces Mr. Jin Young Tsai. And I want to welcome you all to this discussion, which is a Chevron forum. And I want to thank my friends at Chevron. Thank you very much. And so I think uh, I'll leave it at that. Peter, please come on up. Thank you, Dan. It's, uh, as usual, a pleasure to be here at CSIS. Uh, and I think we're very lucky and happy to have Jin Yong Tsai here today. As you probably all know, the IFC is uh, by far the largest provider of equity and loan uh, capital to uh, the developing world uh, of any uh, in development institution. Uh, and uh, the CEO always can influence uh, very much what the IFC does. Let me just start with a very brief uh, story. When I received a hat, a hat hunter call in 1998, uh, whether I would like to run this, uh, the IFC, first thing I called my wife and said, would you move with me to Washington? And the <laughs> second one was to an ex-managing director of the World Bank who J.P. Morgan had hired uh, to introduce us to governments. And I said, look, uh, I might have the chance to run the IFC. Uh, what do you think? Should I uh, do it? And he said, no, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> having, having worked for 29 years at J.P. Morgan, you don't want uh, to enter a bureaucracy. And then he said, but you know, on second thoughts, uh, do it because you're actually sitting on top of the bureaucracy. Thanks a lot. And you can achieve That's a few great. things. I actually believe that uh, most of the IFCs have put their imprint on, on the IFC over the years. Um, I was very lucky to change the business model at the IFC. We were forced to do it because our revenues were disappearing slowly but surely uh, from uh, accompanying uh, companies in the de uh, developed world into the emerging markets to provide political risk. Uh, we massively went directly into the emerging markets. We transferred our people there and started making investments directly to local companies. Uh, and we provided loans to local companies. Uh, that was actually much more fun, much more exciting but also made the F, uh, IFC, interestingly, much more profitable than it had ever been before. Now, of course, it's not that easy for a CEO because you have to watch out for uh, important stakeholders. The stakeholders are the shareholders in the form of a, a permanent board here in Washington. Uh, and I think if you uh, convince these shareholders, and if you convince the board, uh, and if you are nice to them, you can achieve quite a bit. Then, of course, there are the powerful NGOs as stakeholders, and I felt always that it is important to listen to them, because what they had to say uh, about our projects uh, in terms of sustainability was important, and I think the IFC has done a lot in terms of fostering sustainability of companies in developing countries. And of, of course, then there's the World Bank as a stakeholder, the president. And uh, here I'm particularly looking forward to hear from Mr. Tsai what he has to say, because as you are aware, there's an effort uh, which will merge the IFC into the World Bank or the World Bank into the IFC, however you look at this. Uh, this has been uh, tried for many years. Um, when I was uh, head of the IFC, there were also efforts in the World Bank to not only to work closer, but I would almost call it to absorb the IFC. I think a very good integration is probably an ex excellent thing for the World Bank Group. Uh, at the time when I was uh, head of the IFC, I refused to do it because uh, our thoughts were still far too much apart. In fact, when I started at the IFC, there were some serious people who thought that the private sector 
could not much contribute to development in poor countries. That, of course, has changed dramatically. Jin Yong has uh, already, uh, what I can see and what I've heard, made his imprint on, of the IFC. Um, he uh, started as a young professional at the World Bank and then worked over the last years as an investment banker. He has experience in developing countries and uh, from all what I've seen, he's a powerful, not totally uncontroversial leader in the IFC, but I think one of the important ones for the future. Jin Yong, it's a pleasure Thank you, Peter. for us to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to sit here or do it there, either way? Okay. Peter, thank you for that kind introduction. You know, I uh, started uh, in IFC October 1st, uh, 2012. And uh, before that, about uh, 10 months ago, I got a call from Headhunter as well, saying, uh, hey, there's an interesting opportunity. Are you interested? And uh, I didn't spend any effort to convince my wife. She's, she was very happy to come back home. So, <laughs> so I have an American wife. We actually met in the World Bank. So uh, in a way, the World Bank group uh, kind of uh, made my career. And um, so coming back to this institution, uh, I think uh, there, there are a few things have changed. I remember uh, I grew up in China. And uh, at that time, in the early 80s, uh, Chinese uh, uh, under Deng trying to find a way on economic reform. And the World Bank was instrumental. And uh, there was a couple of gentlemen I always remember not only uh, kind of uh, help chi Chinese uh, in navigating the uh, reform and also really helped a lot of, um, uh, to me uh, on my career. One is uh, Ed Lim, uh, Peter, you would know, remember him. And uh, also uh, uh, Kyle. Right now, he's the uh, vice chairman of Deutsche Bank. So uh, fast forward almost 20 years, a uh, return to IFC. The world is a different place. And uh, I just want to give you a quick uh, snapshot on what we are doing. You know, really, I, I remember when I just started, I look at uh, you know, all these uh, great uh, leaders before me. <laughs> I thought I got to uh, find a way to further build this uh, great institution. And when I started uh, you know, 2012, IFC, uh, I think, has a historical uh, year in terms of what we call the commitment volume. Basically, you know, the commitment we are uh, we prepare to to finance uh, is not the same as how much money you send out the door. It's about twenty billion dollars a year, just roughly. You know, we had about seventy billion dollars uh, balance sheets at that time, and um, you know, right now we have eighty-five billion dollars. So <laughs> over the last couple of years, we increased by fifteen billion, and. Uh, about, about $20 billion, we, I was just roughly uh, about a quarter, about five, four to five billion dollars equity. You know, that would put us into one of the uh, larger uh, investors as a uh, equity investor in emerging markets. And uh, the rest of it is, is a loan, you know, fixed income products. And uh, at the beginning, I saw about 15 billion is pretty impressive. But we look, you analyze it, and uh, I would say about 60% of that is long-term financing and 40% the trade finance, short-term. And these are all interesting products. So for me, I would look at, this is where I start. What would be the thing new, useful, I can help the institution to, to build to make IFC even more impactful? I don't know how much you know, you know there's always this view of the World Bank, you, know, you give free money, it's, it's not. You know? The World Bank have IBRD, you know, the, the group has IBRD, which really they lend money to the government. The government has to provide a guarantee. IFC, we, we have a different balance sheets. This is totally not guaranteed. We do finance based on commercial terms, and we are on our own, to be honest. If we screw up, you know, we, we would uh, ruin our, uh, the quality of our credits. Uh, that now the AAA is one of the myths, in my view. We look at the risk of our investment projects and uh, look at uh, the, the geography and the product we, got, we get in. And we are you know, pretty lucky. We get a triple A, and we have good performance year in and year out. 
there are only one year in 2009 we lost money. And most of the time, most of the year, you know, like last year we, um, we made uh, more than a billion dollars net uh, income before contribution to IDA. So that would put us, you know, kind of a return on assets between five to six percent. Is it good? Not good? If I were a private equity player, I thought this is pretty mediocre performance. But as a uh, development financial institution, I think we have established a track record, thanks to Peter and the other uh, leaders in the past, really uh, moved the institution from, at the beginning, pretty much a simple lender to private companies, to a, a institution with multiple products. So for us, the, 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 um, the challenge or the opportunity is really, what will be the next for IFC? in the new world in which uh, I would say there are several key uh, you know, features which is different from the past. One is uh, the world, world is truly connected. Even in the most, yeah. you know, the poorest country, mobile phone is there and people can see the picture, the lives of someone in Paris or New York. So the use, uh, the, the poor people, in spite of their living condition, their aspiration is very different. They know what's going on. Second is um, the inequality and uh, or for that matter, lack of opportunity, you know, the tolerance for that is much, you know, kind of a less uh, tolerant in this way. People d d have much less uh, patience. When I mean, you think of what happened in, uh, in uh, Arab countries, or for that matter, even in Ukraine, you see this, the disease on society, corruption, inequality, lack of, lack of opportunity. So when I think of all this, this new world and I think of the role of development institution like IFC, I think we have just critical role in terms of providing that opportunity, not necessarily just bring the money to the table. To be honest, $20 billion is tiny vis-a-vis -vis the needs. It's more of using our brand, using our credibility, and to bring different pieces together to de deliver the solution. So th that's really how I see um, IFC uh, the future, you know, th for, the, for this, uh, you know, this conversation. And uh, I think we have, gone, we have done well, and, but the future, given the challenge, we still have a lot of work to do. And uh, you know, Peter mentioned about the World Bank change process. You know, Jim, I don't know how many of you have met him. He's a very inspir inspirational leader. He looked at the world, he wants the World Bank to become much more focused on providing solutions than just that's how many loans I, I send up. So how many times I went to the board to approve a project, which is still pr quite pervasive in, in, our, in our institution. We are still quite inward looking, even though you know, the World Bank, you know, not only IFC and also MIGA and the bank, we have a great brand. I, I think what Jim wants to do is to really try to figure out a way, you know, all the uh, players in the group, we leverage on each other's uh, capability to deliver more impactful solutions. And uh, so um, th that's really, uh, you know, as what's going on. You know, I, I know we will talk more about yeah. this uh, a little bit later. Great, thanks yeah. a lot. Thank you for being here, uh, Jin Young Sai. Thank you very much. I think, uh, as I was saying earlier in the green room that I think that what uh, IFC is doing is the future of development and it has the opportunity to meet the challenges of the future of development and uh, I think some of what Peter was saying earlier about the fact that there's been a total mind shift both in the developing world but also in development institutions about the private sector I think has partially been a result of the, the success of organizations like IFC and I think about what IFC has done in the microfinance sector, for example, or mm -hmm. where you're the largest, I think the largest investor in the world in microfinance institutions. As a, and I, if I think about the cell phone telephony sector, I think you all helped Mo Ibrahim become a billionaire by helping set up Celtel, if I recall correctly, as well as setting up the, one of the first cell phone companies in Afghanistan. So you have been an important enabler of, 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 uh, of uh, much innovation and connectivity around this issue of the, the world being more connected. One of the things I wanted to ask you is about the issue of infrastructure and logistics. We were also touching on that uh, beforehand. When I think about IFC, it was an organization that was sort of built on project finance historically. Talk about the need for infrastructure, how you're supporting and catalyzing the role of the private sector in infrastructure. Perhaps I think there are synergies certainly with MEGA 
and the World Bank as well. If you could talk a little bit about that, the, the need as well as how the bank group and particular IFC is responding to that need. Yeah, I mean, infrastructure, particularly in Africa, actually beyond Africa, uh, very, several very basic elements. Number one is access to energy. You know, really, uh, we you have, you know, so many people, really uh, just, you know, in aggregate, uh, 1.2 billion people in the world has no access to electricity. And in Africa, if you take South Africa away, less than, I would say, 30% people uh, have access. So the rest, you know, 70% plus has no access to electricity. You can't do anything. I mean, really, uh, I, I have been to quite a few countries. Sometimes you land in the evening, you drive the car, you, you know, the bumpy road. But more important, you see the people, young people, just uh, standing on the road. You say, what a waste. We, we got to deliver the electricity, and which, in my view, it's not like lack of money. The world, there are plenty of money out there. And uh, frankly, there are a lot of uh, different ways to do it. And uh, you know, certainly there are multiple elements needed to make this happen. So um, you know, for, for IFC, you know, since I, you know, I, um, I spent a lot of time in, uh, in, in investment banking, particularly I spent the last about 13 years in Goldman Sachs, I, I like to do project which truly have real impact. And certainly, I'm not saying this smaller product has no impact. We got to do uh, things uh, in a coordinated way. And uh, like in Africa, it's not just turning on the lights. It's important to turn on the lights. We got to create an environment where African can develop their agriculture, manufacturing. They got to create jobs. So sometimes I get people saying, you can't do baseload hydro. And you can only do solar. I say, solar is important. There's no question. Let's put solar there. But solar cannot power real jobs, right? Let's, let's be honest about it. And uh, we need to find a solution, short term, medium term, long term. At the end of the day, we are in the job of eliminating poverty. The best way to get rid of poverty is to create opportunity, uh, sustainable opportunity, so people can make a living. So what we're talking about electricity, another thing very critical is logistics, is transportation. You know, Africa as a continent, there's no, literally no functioning railway except South Africa. You can't move stuff. You know, I've gone to so many different uh, forums, talk about, oh, let's do intra-Africa trade. And I have a lot of pineapple, you have this and that. You can't move the thing. You know, the, this good agriculture product is rotten. No one's going to, to, to grow it. And certainly, you know, with a huge amount of young, a uh, uh, lot of youth and a very young population, you need to create real jobs. So I, I think the sense of urgency for me and for our institution right now is really, uh, I think, is so much more than before in the sense we are focusing on a lot of projects we have been doing for years, but we are also waiting to spend time and efforts on some of the much larger and more risky transactions, and uh, such as Inga. I don't know how much you, you know. This is the dream for Africa. If we somehow can harness the, the power there, it's this about is in the Congo. This is the, the hydro DRC. dam in Congo. It's, it's a, like it's, it's a Congo River before getting uh, gets into the Atlantic the Atlantic Ocean. You're about 20 kilometers di 20 kilometers distance. The water drop 150 meters. It, it's just the, the most ideal place to build hydro. There's virtually nobody live there, and because the, the water was so rapid, you can't do uh, shaping or navigation either. So this has been a dream for African for. I don't know, three decades, four decades. And if we somehow get this thing done, it's a take about 80 to $100 billion, two and a half times as three gorges. And Africa's energy, 60 to 70% will be met with this one transaction. Oh my God. So we are spending time with our World Bank colleagues. And uh, I, I hope, you know, if there's a one transaction in my uh, tenure in IFC, we can, if we can break the ground on this, will be fantastic because it has no emission and it's a clean energy and uh, it's just, you know, it's not only, you know, it's about three cents per kilowatt hour at the generation. If you add another five cents on transmission, it's the most competitive clean power you can imagine. It's a fabulous project. Yeah. Well, we're, we stand ready to help you here at CSIS to help you get that done. That's fantastic. I hope that does happen. I've heard about Inga and I didn't realize how, how <coughs> massive it is. It's a massive, it's really, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's one of the things I hope we, you know, with the World Bank, 
uh, group of all of us play a role. Not that, uh, frankly, we are going to finance a small portion of it. It's more of we using our convening power to bring different you know, players together to make it happen. You may use the conversation on infrastructure perhaps to, to have a couple of, to, to build on that on a, on a couple of topics. You talked about it's important just an meeting the needs of countries where they're at and there's increasing demand and I agree with you. Could you talk about how you think about state-owned enterprises because I think this is also, because I think, uh, I think this is relevant to this discussion. Yeah. This is an um, uh, issue particularly given I, I'm very uh, uh, sensitive, conscientious about this because I'm from China. So uh, some of the partners we're working with is Chinese state-owned enterprises. There are a lot of nervousness. And this is how I look at it. Okay, I'm much more focused on what is the solution. In five years, can I deliver the electricity to Guinea? I was in Guinea as well recently. The whole country, okay, the whole country has about 120 megawatts installed capacity. And about 20 is only about 100 functioning somewhat. Okay, you go to meet the president on and off electricity, just, it's, a, it's a disaster, right? And uh, there was a project, apparently some other people tried. And then certainly this happened before my time and uh, a Chinese company eventually took over this product, it's a hydro. So it's, they literally finished ahead of time, six months ahead of the schedule. So this 240 megawatts hydro power plant about 110 kilometers away from the capital city. So we are scrambling, trying to figure out how can we build a distribution network. Otherwise you have power ready, but there's no distribution. So the president, everyone's very nervous and ask us for help. So in a situation like this, to be honest, I don't even care who is the state owned, not state owned. People are looking for a solution. If there's a power already built, I'll be very happy actually I work with the EDF. We're trying to bring them in to really uh, take a stake. IFC and EDF, we, we take a in stake. In the distribution in company. In the distribution company and st stop the stealing. To be honest, it's about stealing. 70% of electricity is stolen. As simple as that, right? So I'm much more focused on what is the solution I can deliver we can deliver to, to the people in, in Guinea or other places. Using the infrastructure as the, Af I'll use African infrastructure as a, just to key off it again on a couple other questions is, when I talk to folks in the U.S. government context and they talk about OPEC or catalyzing American uh, investment in power infrastructure in Africa, uh, one of the issues is the enabling environment or the rule of law, and one of the ways in which the, the World Bank contributes to that is through its investment climate work and the related doing business indicators. Could you talk a little bit about how the World Bank Group th thinks about investment climate? You have some, I think you have a window into that. I think there's, a, if I recall correctly, there's a MEGA, IFC, and World Bank joint department. I don't know if that's been changed. It's, no, it's a still the same, what, what we call a business climate uh, department. Actually, the joint IBRD, IFC uh, undertaking, we found that uh, department really uh, improve on corporate governance, on doing business environment. Uh, it has been uh, really making a huge contribution to build the capacity. We'll continue to do that. Yeah. Actually, if anything, this new, u this unit will be uh, in the global practice. Actually, uh, I, I think we are going to even uh, continue not only support it and enhance it. It's and, the, uh, uh, sorry, it's the minister, the former minister of commerce from Costa Rica. Exactly, this, exactly, this, this, exactly. This so uh, this is a big part of our offering and uh, you mentioned doing business report. It's a very useful exercise and uh, it's a product has been going on for 10 years. What I found interesting is it gives a concrete target for the government in the area where they need to improve uh, environment. You know, basics such as how many days you take to get a license? Uh, how many they would take to get electricity connected? You know, there's no perfect measure, but at least there's certain measurement in this exercise really helping the government to really get their focus on improving the, uh, the what I call, actually it's not doing business, starting a business environment. And, and we will continue to support it. And uh, about a year ago, after Jim uh, uh, assumed the position, the, because there are a lot of controversy yes. on the ranking, and uh, there was an external uh, panel uh, did an evaluation. They made some recommendations. I, I think right now this uh, work continue, uh, will continue. Actually, the 14, 2014 report will be published in a couple October. months, October. 
And uh, you know, going forward, there could be even more refined methodology sure. on ranking, so on and so forth. So I, I think, you know, like all the other things we do, it's not a panacea to solve all the problem, but it's a useful tool for us to really guide the government in improving the uh, business environment. Just, just again on, uh, on infrastructure, and I think about one of the innovations that your predecessor, Lars Dunell, put, uh, put uh, on the table, which was the asset management company. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about what the asset management company is? Because I think it's related to this issue of the World Bank Group and IFC's ability to catalyze investment and to yeah. bring other players to the table. And I think it's related to this, this conversation about infrastructure and power, for example. Yeah, the asset management company has been around for about four years. And now we have um, about $6.3 billion under management. It's, it's pretty... Uh, and where's that money coming from? Well, it's coming from some of the, uh, the most, what the blue, bluest uh, chips com uh, investors. You know, literally you have some of the best solvent wealth funds yep. and uh, some, uh, you know, pension funds. And uh, all in all, I, I think, has been a great success. And the, the challenge for us is, I mentioned about our balance sheets, uh, size of our balance sheets, $85 billion, our book value on equity only at about 22, 23 billion. It's, to be honest, it's small vis-a-vis -vis the risk we take. But you know, doing capital increase for IFC, I think, is a complicated process. Meanwhile, we want to kind of find different ways to, to be able to mobilize additional capital. So as a management company, I think you know, quite innovative in the sense it's the first time a multilateral institution managing third party money. It's required bigger culture change. You know, for a lot of us in development financing uh, business, we think always result, you know, impact. But actually, you also have fiduciary duty if you manage other people's money. Even though in our current business model, without the ASI management company, we also have a fiduciary duty. Sure. But because we are bond holders, you know, our, our fiduciary, but a lot of time we forgot about it. Have the AS AMC has been very helpful to put that dimension of thinking into our you know, team. And uh, we have, uh, you know, under the $6.3 billion, we have different regional funds, different uh, you know, industry funds. We recently uh, closed the $1.2 billion global infrastructure fund, which is equity fund. You know, it's really, uh, I think in this environment, particularly people are very uh, kind of uh, nervous about the emerging market. To be able to read that money and uh, deploy it, and uh, it's pretty good, uh, testament of the brand power. Absolutely. Can you, could you um, talk about the role of small and medium-sized enterprises and how you all think about them? I mean, you used to have, a, in, in years past, there was an SME department. There's, there's been technical assistance work to support small and medium-sized enterprise. How do you think about small and medium-sized enterprise today? It's the critical focus. Remember, I mentioned earlier, what do we do? We create opportunities for people, for creating jobs. Most of the jobs in emerging markets are small and medium enterprises, in Africa, in other places. And uh, the way we do that, you know, we, we, there was a very good piece of work uh, uh, completed a few years ago called the job study. So we did a survey of more than 40,000, I think, enterprises. Uh, the conclusions could not be more uh, clear and simple. Job creation required broadly four things access to infrastructure, particular power, access to finance, and the business environment, doing business, you know, and uh, skill, training. If you get these four things right in sequence, and the jobs will be there, because I always believe, regardless, you know. That's very tweetable, by the way. It's <laughs> a very, very, uh, I, I found it's That's a great. very simple summary on what we do. That's great. What we do is to debottle neck each, each of the category would need to be done. I talk about power and logistics. I talk about business environment. And by the way, we invest in education. You know, the most recent example, we invest in the Koskota Bridge School. This is a fascinating story. It's a school operated by a couple, American couple. And I remember when I got this document, said we're going to go to the board. We said, Shannon May, I know this lady. Once upon a time, when I was in Goldman Sachs, we were doing a community teamwork. We went to a remote place after the flood. We were supposed to help to build a school, a bunch of Goldman Sachs bankers. in China. In China. I went to that remote place. I suddenly to saw this blonde girl. I said, what are you doing here? She was teaching. She was doing a PhD dissertation. She, you know, she was uh, in the uh, education uh, 
uh, department in Berkeley yeah. on, on, on um, education for the poor kids. Now, and she and her boy, uh, boyfriend, now Jay and Shannon, they built this bridge school uh, you know, funded by Bill Gates Foundation and a few others and us too. And right now they operate a school with more than 100,000 students in Kenya, $6 per month. And the best thing they did is using, is using technology to make sure the teachers teach, as simple as that. They observe in many of those rural, college, uh, rural schools, teachers, they, they are not inspiring. They get bored, they are, they are not paid. So their quality of teaching is bad and the kids lost interest to study. So what they did is they have this technology with iPad. Every morning they gave them the teacher new contents. And only when the teacher finished teaching, there's a feedback on if they did their job or not. So this school is doing great. And it so prevents absenteeism exactly. from teachers, and, et cetera. Uh, really, just, it's f fabulous. And we also invest in Laureate, which is doing a lot of uh, vocational training. So we invest in a variety of things. So come back to the job creation, the four key uh, elements. You know, we, we want to be playing a critical role, at, at least taking a risk, trying to uh, not only invest in creating good business model, uh, also in kind of disseminating good practice into different uh, parts of the world. You know, recently, uh, this couple was awarded by um, the WEF as the, uh, you know, the year of social entrepreneurship of the year award. We are gonna go with them to Nigeria, to other parts of Africa. We see our role is really to build that foundation for job creation, which eventually, you know, come back to your SME question, because there's nothing better by helping people to learn, they can become their own boss and to hire, hiring people. You know, recently another example we, we, we did was, uh, uh, you know, we, we are very big on uh, gender financing. Yes. So we just, together with Goldman Sachs, and they have a 10,000 women program, pretty well known. Yep. So we are in the process of raising $600 million facility through multiple investors, purely lent to women entrepreneurs so they can with government training and come to us, we give them the finance so they can go out to create jobs. It's fantastic. I, I really want to uh, applaud what IFC has done over 10 plus years in the area of, of private schools and, and your, your example of, I think Peter, I think you were very involved with helping get that started at IFC, where there's been a, I think traditionally a little bit of a bias in the traditional development community about supporting private schools and slums and elsewhere. I think IFC has taken a very brave stance in providing financing or business training to these institutions. So I think it's very important and it's in line with what you were describing earlier. I also think the sort of thought leadership you've done, like such as the Let's Work report or some of the other reports that have been done on the, si the role of the for-profit uh, healthcare sector in Africa and, and then other reports after that, whether it's youth training in, in the Middle East or with the water footprint work. It's, yeah. it, so I, I do think this issue of thought leadership, best practice, your convening power, it's, it, it's, it's very important to, to development. Um, could you talk about, I suspect you get called into broader multilateral conversations, whether it's the G20 or other sorts of uh, multilateral fora. I, I suspect, in, it, certainly when I was at IFC, there was sort of an increasing amount of demand for sort of either IFC's brand, its catalytic finance power, its advisory services, or its thought leadership. How are you being pulled into those into those sorts of conversations? Uh, well, I have never been in so many meetings in my whole life since I joined IFC, <laughs> let me tell you. And much more, a, uh, I think, you know, these are the interesting fora to discuss issues. Uh, to be honest, there are way too many talkers and doers. That, that's my observation. So I want to make IFC not only be part of that process, so we, are, we were in B20, and uh, we are in variety of, um, um, you know, for uh, talk about you know the, what we do, and also on some you know, public global issues like climate change, you know, it's an important issue. And uh, I have been uh, working with my team. We feel okay, talking is great, but not enough. And uh, so we are also kind of a based on the uh, what we think where we can add most value to start to do things. One example I give to you is uh, I don't know if you follow much about climate change issue. One of the most amazing thing is the gas flaring in Nigeria. You know, this is perhaps, Nigeria has one of the top, maybe top 
10, at least top 10, maybe even uh, you know, higher ranked gas reserve in the world. Okay? If you go to Lagos, sometimes in the, in, in the weather permit, you can see this huge fireball. If you fly over, it, it's, Nigeria has so much gas. And the, you know, the oil company in Chevron uh, maybe re-injected uh, in the field, but there's enough limit, and so they flare. And then you look at Nigeria as a country has no power. Something has to be done. And uh, apparently there has been different forum talk about how to stop the, uh, the, the, the flare. My own view is I told our team, I said, look, there have been a lot of discussions, and uh, they're always at the, each of the con uh, conclusion of those meetings, if the government is ready to do something, we are ready to help. So we have observed government has not been ready for a long time. Let's help us to make them ready. So I, I, uh, this is quite, you know, Peter, I don't know if you know this, we usually don't do this. So we have, have our team, both the industry team and the local team say, look, let's bring all the people together to figure out what do we need to do. Nigeria has undertaken pretty brave reform on power sector. They break the monopoly, unbundle the power sector. And based on my own experience, I spent a lot of time in the industry. I said, look, you can do whatever you know, real reorganization at the you know, power part of value chain. If there's no incremental gas supply, what you're going to end up is, yeah, there are a lot more players in it. And it was my monopoly, no power. Right now, you have multiple players. There's still no power. But guess what? The price will go up. It will be a disaster for the population. So I, I went to the president, to, to Ngozi, I said, look, there's a critical thing we need, we need to do. We got to fix this gas problem. Otherwise, we're all going to be in bad shape. So guess what? They are responding so fast. So we were able to literally come in a meeting. You literally have everybody. Yesterday in London, still going on. You have the Minister of Petroleum. Everyone's saying, we got to get this thing done. So we have an action plan. Uh, it take about maybe five to ten billion dollars. Just do some pipeline infrastructure. There are a lot of other things that I don't want to get too, too much complication. The, the, the thing I feel on this, what you said, there are a lot of interesting ideas. I'm looking forward to working with my team in IFC in the area we can add value. We not only become a you know, discussant, we are also the executing the doer. The doer. So that's what we are uh, hoping we will we'll get there. You know, it's, nothing is easy, you know, otherwise, uh, this thing would have been done a long time ago. Well, I do think one of the great things about IFC is I, I think it's an institution that's often kept its head down and just done deals yeah. and sometimes hasn't gotten the full credit it deserves. It, certainly, its shareholders know who they are and its partners know who it is, but sometimes some of its broader stakeholders don't realize the importance of what it's doing. I think in the last several years, maybe in the last five or six years, it's certainly increased its profile, and I'm so pleased that you're leading the institution because I think you have a an important role to play, and it, it, the institution itself has a very important role uh, in the future of development. So I think it's uh, very heartening to hear all of this. Thank you. I know we have time for a few questions, if, and I know you've got a, we got a hard stop at three o'clock. You've got you've got to go back to doing as opposed to talking. So we should we, do, let's yeah. see who we've got here. Um, let's see. So I'm going to ask um, this gentleman here, my friend back there and my friend from Palacio y Asociados there. So we'll start with those three. Hey, uh, I'm Nicolas Montbrie. I'm the head of the Oxfam International Office in Washington. Uh, I mean, the same of the discussions about the future of the IFC, and sorry to talk about bad things, but I just wanted to know from you, there was this big case in January about the IFC investment in Dinant in Honduras. Yeah. With the CIO report, I and know. things about the failure to implement your own standard. I just wanted to see how this case changed your vision for the IFC and how you're going to change things. Why don't we take this World Bank style and we'll capture three questions okay. and then you'll have okay. a chance to Very respond. Good question. So, that's, so then, back there. It's uh, Dana Marshall with Transnational Strategy Group. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about uh, the IFC investor, uh, excuse me, the advisory services and creative ways that you may be able to reach out to. Um, uh, private sector advisors here yeah. uh, to sort of move in mutually beneficial directions. Sure. And my, my friend here. Eileen Boniface with Palacio and Associates. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sai, for your presentation and for uh, your transformative role in including the private sector in um, the development world here in Washington. 
Well, how would you view the role of the U.S. In the, um, as we approach the end of the fiscal year and the appropriations process, especially in light of um, uh, gridlock in Congress and specific amendments that infringe upon priority projects, especially uh, DRC Inga, and um, how you anticipate changes in the, in the next fiscal year? Uh, let's talk about demand. Okay, this is one of the uh, quite famous case. You know, the, the story, I don't know how much you know, it was a uh, loan we made to a client who owns multiple line of business. The loan we made was for a facility expansion to make soap, okay, on the existing site, just additional capacity expansion. And uh, the discussion happened before there was a military coup. So, uh, you know, Everything was agreed, everything was fine, you know, things were stable. And then there was a military coup, certainly you know, the new regime, the government, and a lot of farmers came back saying, hey, there's a problem, there's a land dispute. Although that land has nothing to do with this particular facility. And uh, apparently, if you listen to, you know, there are different versions of stories, and uh, you know, the, the, the owner of the land and the farmers eventually had a conflict, and certain people, quite a few people were killed. Mm. And if you listen to the owner say the farmer killed us first, so we had to defend and vice versa. It's a tragedy, no question about it. And uh, so looking back, you know, certainly, you know, it's a bad case. Uh, we, we committed about $30 million, I think we only dispersed half of that. And uh, NGOs, everyone was just really, uh, I understand the, the, the uh, kind of uh, the people are very upset. And uh, basically the headline news is IFC finance uh, killers. Look, we do about 600, uh, 600 transactions a year. Once in a while, you make mistakes. On this particular case, I could say that we could have looked at the broader context. Certainly, we could not predict the coup, but we could have understand better on the dispute of the land, you know, really assess what are the risks, right? So that's really the lessons learned. But the challenge for us is, Honduras is one of the poorest country in, uh, in Central America. There are many other places. Really, for those countries which can have a viable business, most likely will be in agriculture because you know, they have special competitive advantage, you know, so on and so forth. So how do we deal with helping agriculture sector to grow, become commercial, create wealth? You need a lot more thinking and need a lot more help from the World Bank colleagues. That's where you know, Peter mentioned about how this whole World Bank, World Bank group thing. I'm not too sure we can solve all the problem, but honestly, if we were able to assess the, the land issue better, we could have avoided that mistake. Okay. On the advisory service, we have uh, over the years built a quite a diversified offering. Some of, I have to be, you know, honest, some are better than others. You know, we have some of the best experts in certain sectors. They can not only advise on structuring, on financing, but they are true industry expertise. They can literally help uh, the small farmers or small companies to yeah. grow. And, uh, you know, if, uh, you know, I have uh, Lucas standing there, you know, if you have any particular, you know, just contact him, he'll c connect you. Our organization is a little bit, uh, I would say, uh, complicated. But we do have an advisory service team, not only in a, in a standing alone, uh, stand alone form, and also in each of the industry verticals. So, so that's what I can tell you. On the U.S., I, I think you know, U.S. business, in my view, is our, some of our best partners. You know, I talk about Inga. My, I, I keep ta I've been talking to quite a U.S. company. You know, United States represent, the United States is the world leader, there's no question about it. When U.S. is there, U.S. companies is there, there, I feel the project will be structured better and it will provide a, you know, better transparency and it just could be a better deal. I mean, are U.S. companies are going to be in all the transactions? No, we have to understand what their interests are. And uh, so we have to be selective, we have to be able to, what I call, pitch the right idea to the right company. And uh, I'm not too sure, I mean, the U.S. government has always, you know, USAID, we work closely, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, other U.S. Uh, government uh, agencies, they're all very supportive. But given our role is really working with the private sector, 
our task is really working with U.S. companies, you know, in places where, you know, I understand U.S. companies are going, not going there for charity reasons, and they are expanding their business market share. That's, that's perfect, actually. We, we feel, uh, you know, we have had a good relationship. We can do much more. You know, we, we are, we have a active, what I call the uh, client coverage model. We are going to cover more U.S. companies to really demonstrate, uh, explain to them what's going on in different parts of the world. And uh, not only working with them, we can also help the U.S. company to build partnership with others. Good. Take a couple more questions. Okay, my friend Bob Berg and Peter. Uh, Bob Berg, serial talk talk offender. Uh, um, the, f the government to government aid industry has a club where they exchange information, lessons learned, and so forth. Uh, but uh, I'm wondering whether there's an adequate way of learning between particularly the China, the Brazils, the re really some major players where in the private sector, I'm wondering whether there's a way of sharing the lessons across the donors' private sector work that could be more uh, transparent and more interesting. Peter. Um, I have a question, perhaps because I'm not up to date anymore. But I have to say that I'm kind of jealous when I listen to you talking about, for instance, Inga and your optimism. Um, I inherited a project when I took over the IFC, which was called Bujagali. I spent five years on it myself, uh, and it was killed in the end by the president because we had a slight corruption case there. Uh, in the meantime, it has been built. Um, how is your relationship with the NGOs? I, I refer to it. Uh, I had a sometimes rough relationship. Um, sometimes very helpful, sometimes in the case of Bujagali, not very helpful. So, uh, why are you so optimistic? So, <laughs> so, so let me just add to Bob's question I, I, uh, around this issue of, of, a, of a learning community. I'm thinking of the, the Development Assistance Committee, which is the FIFA of the, of the development <laughs> world, of the Major League Baseball Commission of the development world. There is something like that in the development finance. There's been some, some attempts at that, and maybe you might just also talk a little bit about that as well. Yeah, I, you know, I, I came from a world where, you know, my education in business is very much, uh, you have to think ahead of your clients, and uh, you figure out who will be the most likely, you have to think what they want. This, uh, I'm talking about Goldman Sachs, right? I literally, I know who are the potential partners? I'm not saying I know 100% of, of them, at least in this industry I'm uh, focused on. I don't know, I mean, there are all kind of forum, right? You can always go to Africa Power. And, uh, you know, to be honest, a lot of time people going to those uh, uh, conferences, they're not a key decision maker. You know, they, they will go back to report and say, hey, I just went to a conference, it's wonderful, basically same message. You know, we, we, you know, as mentioned earlier, we, IFC, we, we go to a lot of conferences. I said, well, you know, I have never heard one person said I didn't have a good meeting, a conference, but that's not enough. I'm very much focused on, do you have the year of the CEO? I, I, I have this thing, I say, knowing assistant treasure is not enough. Okay, assistant treasure, his mission in life is to squeeze you, give you the lowest margin that you compete against others, okay? You got to go to the CEO. You got to understand what is the strategic imperative, why they need to go to Inga for that matter. Okay, I, I told some of the U.S. manufacturers. I said, look, this is going to go, go on for for a long time. How many turbines you want to sell, right? And how many tractors, trucks you need to to, to sell? You you got to pitch to them. You mean, look, all our businessmen, they have their mission in life. They work for the shareholder to whatever the reason. We have to be able to really understand why they should come with us to do things which good for them, uh, also for our countries. This is similar to uh, Peter, to your, I'm still learning to work with NGO. I believe we are all, to a large extent, there is a common purpose to help to deal with some of the most challenging issues. Do I agree with them on everything? I, I don't think so. I don't think they would agree with me on a lot of things. I, you know, I guess, I just feel when the things 
they are right, they should be done. I don't know what is the alternative. You know, let's talk about Yinga, Buja Gali. Finally, you know, thank you, are persistent. Eventually, it took 10 years. It took 10 years to build a 240 megawatts power plant. You know, I'm coming from a country that can be done in two years, maybe even shorter. And certainly, we should do things differently. I'm not saying we'll copy that. I, I said, as I said earlier, we do need to have a sense of urgency because the world is moving forward. If we don't really help, I don't know what the world will be. I mean, I have to say, every time I go to, you um, know, I remember, i just give you one example. I was remember uh, in a car ride going to the airport with the Minister of Finance. You know, there are a lot of kids playing, I won't name the country, you know, kind of uh, playing soccer. It really, I said, wow, this kids, it's just so much muscle. And the Minister of Finance, I have to feed them, help me. That's a basic, I mean, li literally no one, you know, you, you, you hear from this, you know, person, literally they're desperate for help. And uh, uh, this uh, Liberia president, I, I was Ellen in Johnson's a meeting, yeah, I was with, with her, I mean, with Jim Kim meeting her. She literally told Jim, she said, I need electricity because the whole country has no, I mean, the distribution, all the copper was taken away, there's nothing left virtually. And uh, what she told Jim was, look, all these young people, the only thing they knew was fighting. I got to give them a chance, so help me. I mean, these are the things I see it as about very powerful. And by the way, this is not, not like, you know, we have seen this in other places, you know, it can be done. It's not like that. It's challenging from getting things done, but not challenging from technical you know, solution aspect. So that's how I feel. I feel, you know, the development financial institutions, uh, particularly you know, myself and the, my IFC team, we are very much have this sense. Let's can build on what we have been, you know, a good foundation. We have been successful, but let's have some sense of urgency, and uh, let's figure out a way to at least, you know, try it. I can't guarantee everything will be perfect. I can't guarantee there won't be another demand. I hope not. But the truth is, unless we try, you know, the alternative is not much better, right? The stakes couldn't be higher. Thanks yeah. very much. Thank you. Please join me in thanking Jin Young Sai. <laughs>